Be the Talk, episode 313, featuring Joe Cursillo. Welcome to Be the Talk. We go behind the talk seven days a week for tips and techniques to help you change the world. I'm Nathan Eckel, and a talker myself, I'm interviewing others who change the world with their talk. You can too, even if you've never given a talk before. Let's get started with today's show. We are live with Joe Cursillo. Joe, are you ready to talk? I am ready to talk. Joe Cursillo is a speaker, author, and consultant. He's the founder of The Mind Shark, and he is The Mind Shark. Inspired by years of teaching, trial advocacy, and entertaining audiences as a thought reader, Joe Cursillo has dedicated his life to improving the communication skills of his corporate and business clients as a thought leader and author. Uh, Joe Cursillo, welcome to the talk. Good to be here, Nate. Your talk is called The Mobilizing Power of a Unified Vision. I got to be in the room for that, and uh, I love that you had like a crystal ball. You you talked about the crystal ball, but then you talked about being able to read the audience and have some real practical tools to do that. So, Joe, please take us behind the talk. Sure. Um, The talk is actually born from a book that I wrote. And the book is called Getting to Us, Discover the Ability to Lead Your Team to Any Result You Desire. Uh, I wrote the book and uh, decided that Chapter 2 would make a great TED Talk. So I applied for the TED Talk in Harrisburg. And by the way, you mentioned the crystal ball. It's never far from me. I love it. And, and I think you had either either you actually had a smoke machine or we tried to have a smoke machine for you and just kind of enhance the the ambiance yeah. of the of the of the crystal ball. But, uh, it, you know, and, and the, the talk is so recent that it's not live yet on the YouTube channel. So I couldn't like prep and review like I normally do. But I, I, I remember that the, the main thrust of your talk, it was it wasn't so much on the crystal ball. That was more of a foil. It was more about being present and mindful and really in the moment. So please just kind of remind me and everybody else about some of the takeaways from that talk, Joe. Sure. Let me start with the fact that the purpose of the crystal ball was to make a point. And um, as a mind reader on stage, I obviously play with the mind and use the crystal ball as a prop. But here, here's the relationship of the crystal ball, in my mind, is companies spend millions of dollars to bring in consultants to tell them what they should already know. And my issue is that if you take your staff, your team, your people, whoever it is you're leading, and you treat them like human beings, give them a cause they can believe in, give them something that they can be a part of and give them a sense of nobility. They're going to do what you want them to do. And the crystal ball came in basically as my prop to say, if you really want to spend money, go hire a psychic reader um, or just treat everybody like humans. And that's where the ball came in. So I love that. And I'm remembering that whole piece now. Uh, It's funny because uh, it's just like, in our own lives, it's like when when we decide on our own that we really want something and we really want to spend money on something, it's really hard not to uh, not to talk ourselves out of that. And we go on and we a lot of times waste the money and not right. be paying attention. So uh, I, there must be a lot of. Um, background and there must be a lot of reason why you're bringing that up not just in the book but in your talk uh, can you give us without embarrassing anyone or putting yourself uh, too much out there can can you kind of water down a couple of case study examples of maybe things that you saw that were were really wasteful and unnecessary um well i, I was going to say i'm the king of that <laughs> i have a room of things i don't need um, so that's not embarrassing. I'm a hoarder. Uh, ah. it, the problem is it, we all, we're all motivated by something that makes us feel good. In fact, this morning, I, when I woke up, I went on Facebook and the first thing I get are notices that five or six people that I know have birthdays and they had fundraisers ah. and people are giving to them because people will try to make a difference. And the concept of an individual fundraiser on your birthday didn't even exist a couple of years ago. But all of a sudden, people decide this is my cause, and people are sending them money 
but it's also sending money to people they wouldn't normally give a gift to. But they're motivated by that need or that desire to fulfill a cause, to be a part of something, and they spend the money. Um, you know, I, unfortunately, my wife likes to tease me because I don't play the guitar well, but every time I see a really cool looking guitar, it ends up on my wall hanging, um, because it makes me feel good. And those guitars around me make me happy. So yeah, we all are looking for something that we can invest our time and energy in to say, this makes me feel good. Well, and I can't help but think uh, a news story broke, uh, again. Uh, not too far away across the river from Philadelphia of that wonderful, heartwarming story. It was a GoFundMe, and there were a couple on the side. There was a homeless guy, and a couple stopped, and they helped them, and they raised like $400,000 for that homeless person and transformed his life. And then uh, I think about six months ago, something came out where the, the guy didn't get the money, the homeless guy didn't get the money. And then I think yesterday or the day before, uh, a story broke that the whole thing was a sham and a scam. And now there's like criminal charges and there's all kinds of stuff like that. So obviously we, we, we love that, that Americans and Canadians and people all over the world are so generous wanting to help people out. We really do want to help people out. But where do you think is the line between, you know, this, this new almost, I, I'm going to call it a fad, which isn't the right word because that's a little too disrespectful, but, um, nobody was motivated enough. Uh, very few people were motivated, so motivated, and I've interviewed one or two of these people on Be The Talk that actually before it became so easy that you could click a couple of buttons to fundraise on your birthday, I interviewed uh, a, a individual on Be The Talk that actually did this years ago when it really required a lot of energy. Where's the line um, between where we really pay attention when it's really remarkable and versus when it's just almost uh, in danger of looking like it's a fad because it's so easy to, to set up Joe. Well, you know, it's funny you say, I, let me tell you last weekend I performed in uh, Havana, Cuba. And after the shows, we were up in a bar on a rooftop and a friend of mine is standing next to me and looks down at a little kid in a window and you could see that this was a place where there was one light on. We're talking about Cuba, a lot of poverty. And he looked at me and said, I would love to be able to give that family money. I don't know if it'll make a difference. And my question was, what would they do with it? Because the society that they live in, what's the difference between, well, and let's start with the average person in Cuba is making like $30 a month. You give them $500, they wouldn't know what to do. So where's the line? The line is asking yourself, what is this person going to do with that money? What is this person going to do with your charity? Because sometimes they need to be led and guided. And that's where I think there's a lot of need is to determine what is good and what is bad. I also know of a GoFundMe page that raised a lot of money for someone and, uh, Unfortunately, it all went into fun and games. Uh, didn't spend one ounce of it on something good. Mm, tragic. And everybody raised money for him, but it's just annoying. Tragic. That's, that's a personal thing. I know the person personally, and I know what they did with it, and it drives me crazy. Well, and this reminds me of, uh, and I, we talk about this on the show a lot, especially with nonprofits and humanitarians. It's this idea. It's not so different at this point uh, in the conversation of the hopefully well-meaning uh, stereotype of the American, you know, humanitarian that's going to rescue the world, go drop into some developing country and throw a bunch of money and build a bunch of buildings before actually talking to the people that they're trying to serve, allow them to buy in, allow them to co-lead uh, and, and really serve and have a sense of ownership and a sense of uh, transferring of responsibility. But instead, we kind of have this messianic complex go in there, throw a bunch of money, and we create people who are psychologically and financially dependent, and it's it's it actually leaves them worse than when we start. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on that? I'm just drawing a pretty big uh, sure. continuum parallel a couple of, couple of steps down the chain. No, I, I understand that, and I think that 
the cause that we're all looking for is to help someone. So we've got to determine what they need. And money doesn't always answer it. And I'll tell you, it sounds you know odd, but I mean, so in Cuba at the very end, um, our waitress for breakfast started talking to my wife and I. And it was clear that this woman had very little money. And she thanked me for the couple tips I gave her. But then all of a sudden the discussion changed. And what we learned was that she didn't need money. What she needed were clothes. Hmm. So my wife and I ended up leaving her. And actually, I'm a very big guy. And she told me her father was grande. So we left her a bunch of clothes because it was a matter of, here, take them. Hmm. Um, we don't need them. We flew home. I actually made space for rum and cigars. So it was okay. But the point is, we gave her the clothes because that's what she needed. It wasn't just raising money or giving them money. It was finding the specific need of the individual. And with her, we were able to do that. So and talk universe, two things, intentionality and taking time to be present and to really care. That's, that's what I hear right there. Powerful. You have to be in that moment and you have to understand that culture. Mm. If you're going to help people, you've got to understand who you're helping. I mean, I, I will help people. Um, you know, I will not give money to someone on the street, but I'll bring them a hamburger if they tell me they're hungry. I, I try to fit the need. I don't want to waste it. You know, it's so. funny because uh, I would do the same thing. Uh, people would ask me for money for a ba- bus pass or money for a hamburger or money for this or money for that. And I said, well, let's just walk over to the, you know, Whole Foods over here, walk over to the McDonald's. And, and it was interesting because uh, most much of the time, and I, again, I'm not, We Joe wants to help people. I really want to help people, but I found it to be not just a, a litmus test, but it, it became a way of, of staying empowered and, and me not feeling like a victim and, and being able to truly help those that wanted the help. If they came with me a couple of blocks and walk out of their way uh, and say no to the opportunity cost uh, for them of, of who else they would meet, then I got to buy someone a meal and have a conversation. It was a great thing. If not, uh, I knew that there was a little bit of a different piece of the story. And uh, I, I just needed to retain, if I'm being asked for, um, you know, for money or for time or focus or to take time out of my day, I just found that to be a probably the most respectful, honoring way that I could respond, respond to people by actually offering to do for them what they said that they wanted from me. <laughs> and so, you know, uh, and, and well, I want to help people. If we can take this back to what I call the leadership model, the bottom line is financial incentives Financial reward is not always the answer. It's absolutely not what people always need. You've got to figure out what they need. And if you find that out, they will do what you want them to do. So for me, if I give someone clothes, at least I know they're wearing them or someone's wearing them. Um, But if I give them money, I have no idea what they're doing it. So I actually feel better knowing that it's going to a good use. Hmm. Well, we've been enjoying this conversation with Joe Cursillo. His talk is called The Mobilizing Power of a Unified Vision, and we're going to find out more about you talk universe and your future talk in the Blitz Round, and we'll be right back. Hey, talk universe. I hope you've been enjoying today's episode with today's guest. But you know what? Many people want more than that. Many people that listen to Be the Talk actually want to give a talk. And if that's you, you're not alone. Listen to the rest of this podcast. At the end, I'll have a free resource for you just for listening. And we're back with Joe Cursillo. It is time for the Blitz Round. I'm going to ask Joe a series of either or questions related to the preparation and performance of his recent talk. Joe, are you ready? I'm a lawyer. Either or doesn't work for me. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're gonna we're gonna keep it moving here. So, uh, Joe, were were you invited to speak or did you apply? I applied. I applied. What advice do you have for other people to get accepted? I, I think that the best thing you can do is take a look at the topic that that specific TED is about. That TEDx is going to have an overlying uh, umbrella of what it wants to be about. And your talk has to fit into that model. If it doesn't, you're not going to be looked at. Yeah. Well, pay attention to the big picture. Absolutely. And it's so easy. It's like 
applying for a grant, if, if you aren't very, very, very specific <laughs> about doing every little thing, you're, you're not going to even be looked at. But if you just tweak your talk to include, you know, a couple of code words, uh, and, and in a meaningful way, then you get consideration. It's powerful stuff. Uh, so Joe, um, you know, as a legal expert, as a lawyer, are you a memorizer? Are you an improviser or are you a blender? I am probably a blender. And did you use that for your talk? Yes. Mm. I mean, obviously, my talk came from my book. So I did write it out in depth and um, thoroughly. But when I stand on stage, I know the book, I know the talk, and I tend to make it fit the mood of the crowd so that I can stay in rhythm. Now, uh, I know the answer to this. I normally ask people, are you a, were you an opener? Were you a closer or in between? And uh, obviously you were a closer because I was in the room. And from one closer to another, what advice do you have for closers? I think if you're a closer, you want to make sure you pay attention to every talk that precedes you. I sat through every one, uh, made some great friends, heard a lot of great messages, and kudos to everybody that was out there with me. But also, too, that temperature of the room is what you have to follow. So you can't just walk out and ignore everything that happened before you. As a closer, your message message doesn't change, but your energy has to absorb the energy of everyone that went before you so that audience leaves knowing that they got value. Now, this is going to be a fun question just for your perspective. And again, I was in the room, but I don't know what your inner world looked like or outer world. So what was the most unexpected, strange, or just plain weird thing that happened before or during your talk? Well, I actually, <laughs> the strange thing was um, right before my talk uh, backstage, I was wired up and ready to go. And they came back. And there was a minor delay before I went on because they realized my microphone was cutting out. So I had to stand behind the curtain and get undressed again, rewired and go back out. And I'm standing there watching going, yeah, there's dead time. (laughs) But uh, it was kind of shocking. I'm ready to go. And all of a sudden it was whoa, pull that horse back into the gate. Let's fix this microphone. <laughs> I love it because I was I was actually emceeing that day in that particular event. I don't remember that happening. So uh, it was, uh, you know, no, one perspective was, to another. <clears throat> it was handled well from the audience mm-hmm. perspective, absolutely. But for mine, it was just like that moment where you hear the bell go and you're ready to run out of the gate. And uh, that's why, by the way, I always travel with my own microphone, but that day I didn't use mine. <laughs> Well, and, and that's that's the thing. Any any public communicator, whether they're a, a trial lawyer or a public speaker or a CEO or an executive or whatever, when you're on and you value your audience, time like go stand still when you when you know you should be addressing and engaging people and they've got those microseconds of attention and focus and you oh, yeah. can't be out there. <laughs> My microphone, I'm sure it only took about 12 to 15 seconds. In my mind, it was an hour and a half. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. It just like forever. Yeah. So because was, once, yeah. once we give you the attention and then we take it back or we figure we, we tune out or we, we shut down, it's really hard to get it back. And you did yeah. that. You did that. And yeah. it wasn't because of the crystal ball. It was because of your engagement and, and the way that you practice your craft, uh, Joe. So congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Audiences energize me. <laughs> well, absolutely. And we've been enjoying this blitz round with Joe Cursillo. His talk is called The Mobilizing Power of a Unified Vision. You can watch that talk on YouTube when it comes out. We will also have it on our show notes page at be the talk.com. It was still so recently, it was still not even maybe a, you know, what, a month ago, not even uh, a full month. Well, it was about a full month ago at this point. And, uh, yeah, we'll have, so we'll have a, a link to that. And we will also have a link to the mindshark.com, the mindshark.com, where you can connect with Joe, uh, on his website. And we'll be back with Joe Cursillo in just a moment for the final word of advice. Hey, talk universe. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. And if you want, to give the talk to change the world, but you don't know how or even where to start, 
no problem at all. Go to be the talk.com forward slash get accepted for my new five day email course that'll show you how absolutely free. Just go to be the talk.com forward slash get accepted. And we're back with Joe Cursillo. It is time for the final word of advice. The, my final word of advice is take a look at the people you're dealing with. Take a moment, listen to them. Don't talk until you've heard them because people will tell you what they need. If you're waiting to speak, you are not listening. Listen, focus, pay attention. When people tell you what they need, then it's time for you to move. It's time for you to get something done. Joe Cursillo, thank you so much for coming on the talk today and sharing your wisdom with Talk Universe. It was a pleasure to be here, and thank you for allowing me, and thank you for everything you're doing. It's great stuff. Thanks for listening to Be The Talk. For tips and resources to help you change the world, go to be thetalk.com. See you tomorrow.